Hi everyone. Today we are going to be covering the topic of electrolysis. Now we're going to return to this topic and do it in a bit more detail when we come to the metal subtopic of unit 3. So today will be a kind of introduction to electrolysis. Previously we've been looking at different types of bonding, covalent bonding and ionic bonding. And if you remember, ionic substances are compounds which consist of a metal and a non-metal ionically bonded together. And those compounds contain positive metal ions and negative non-metal ions. For example, sodium chloride. So if we look at sodium chloride, we know that sodium has got the symbol Na and its electron configuration is 281, meaning that it's got two electrons in its first shell, eight electrons in its second shell and one electron in its last shell. And if we look at chlorine, we know that chlorine has the symbol Cl and it has the electron configuration 287. Two electrons in its first shell, eight electrons in its second shell and seven electrons in its last shell. Now we're only really concerned with the last shell here. And we can see that in order for chlorine to get to a full outer shell, it needs to lose an electron as it's easier for it to lose one electron than gain seven electrons to get to eight. Chlorine has seven outer electrons, so it needs to gain one electron to get to a full eight um, outer shell. So sodium is going to give up its electron to chlorine. And what will happen then is our sodium will become Na plus. So our sodium will become a positive ion with an electron configuration of 2, 8. And chlorine will become a negative ion with an electron configuration of 2, 8, 8. So we've got our positive metal ion and our negative non-metal ion. And that is, going to, is what is making up our ionic substance here. We'll have lots of positive sodium metal ions and lots of negative chlorine non-metal ions. And they will be ionically bonded together in a lattice. So if we apply this logic to other ionic compounds, for example, potassium bromide, potassium has a symbol K, bromine has a symbol Br. I'm looking on my periodic table to find the electron configurations of these atoms. Potassium's electron configuration is 2881. Bromine's electron configuration is 28187. Again, we're only concerned with the outer electrons of both of these atoms. And we find that potassium will give its outer electron up to bromine. And that will produce two ions. It will produce the potassium plus ion, which has an electron configuration of 288, and the bromine negative ion, which will have the electron configuration 28187. Two eight eighteen eights rather. So now our potassium has an outer full outer shell because it's lost an electron to bromine, making it a positive ion, and bromine has a full outer shell because it's taken an electron from potassium, giving it a negative charge and making it a negative ion. For calcium fluoride, calcium's symbol is Ca, fluorine's symbol is F. Calcium has an electron arrangement 2882. Fluorine has an electron arrangement of 27. Now, calcium has two electrons to lose here, but fluorine only needs one electron to get to a full outer shell. So, calcium is going to lose its two electrons, and it's going to give one electron to one fluorine atom and another electron to another fluorine atom. So one of those electrons was going to go to this fluorine atom, one of those electrons is going to go to this fluorine atom. So what we will end up with will be calcium, which will have an electron arrangement of 2, 8, 8. And it will have lost its two electrons, giving it a 2 plus charge. So it's a 2 plus positive ion. Fluorine 
will have gained one electron, giving it an electron arrangement of 2, 8. It will have a negative charge because it's gained an electron from calcium, but there'll be two of those fluorine ions because those fluorine ions have each gained one electron from calcium. If we look at lithium iodide, symbol for lithium is Li, symbol for iodine is I. Lithium's electron arrangement is 2, 1. Iodine's electron arrangement is 2, 8, 18, 18, 7. So here, lithium is going to lose its outer electron to iodine. That will produce a lithium plus ion with an electron arrangement of just two. And our iodine will gain an electron from lithium and it will have an electron arrangement of two, eight, eighteen, eighteen, eight. And it will be a negative ion. So in all of these ionic compounds, we've got both a positive metal ion and a negative non-metal ion. And that is going to become really important as we go on to discuss electronegativity. Firstly, what we want to look at is what is electrolysis? And down here, I've got the word split into two. I've got the electro part, which sounds very much like electricity. and the lysis part, which means splitting. So the definition of electrolysis is splitting a compound using electricity. look at is electrolyzing copper chloride or splitting up copper, cl uh, copper chloride using electricity. The apparatus we need is going to be a direct current supply or a direct current power pack. Now the reason that we need it to be a direct current supply is that we want the charge to be moving around the circuit in one direction. If it doesn't move around the circuit in one direction, if we use, for example, alternating current, then we will not get one product produced at the ele each electrode. We'll get a mixture of products produced at each electrode. We want only one product produced at each electrode. So instead of using alternating current, we use direct current. It's really important that you remember that as a common exam question. We will also have an electrode, or two electrodes rather, and we are using carbon graphite as, your, as our electrode. Your electrode must be able to conduct electricity, so we can use metals as electrodes because they're able to conduct electricity, but for this instance we're going to be using carbon graphite rods. Carbon graphite is the only covalent network that's able to conduct electricity. And we're also going to use an electrolyte to complete the circuit. And our electrolyte is going to be our copper chloride. So how are we going to set up this equipment? Or apparatus. First of all we're going to have a beaker. Inside our beaker we're going to have our copper chloride solution. We're going to have our two carbon graphite rods 
they're going to be in the solution and sticking out the top of the beaker and they're going to be attached to a direct current supply which is pushing charge around our circuit. So we can label all of this. So we've got our electrodes here and our direct current supply. Our direct current DC supply. And that is how we will set up our experiment. So if I was performing this experiment in the lab, I would have my two electrodes set up, my direct current set up, I've got my copper chloride solution, and I'm passing my direct current round my circuit. I've switched on my power pack, my experiment's ready to go. After a few minutes, what I will start to see is a coppery build up at one of my electrodes. And at the other electrode, I will start to see some gas being given off. Now that is two very different products being produced. If you remember, copper chloride is an ionic substance and we've dissolved it in water, which means copper chloride is actually made up of ions. It's made up of copper ions, which are positive because copper is a metal. And it's made up of chlorine ions, which are negative because chlorine is a non-metal. And when you apply the direct current through your circuit that we have set up, you will start to see the chlorine ions, which are negative, moving towards the positive electrode. So my electrode on the left hand side here is positively charged and my negatively char charged ions, my chlorine ions, move towards this electrode. And when they get to the electrode, those chlorine ions lose electrons and they start to become chlorine gas. They start to become chlorine atoms again and that produces Cl2 or chlorine gas. That is the product that is being produced at the positive electrode. At my negative electrode, I've started to see this coppery colour or this coppery substance being produced and it's coated around my electrode. That is because the electrode on the right hand side is negatively charged and my positively charged copper ions are moving towards my negatively charged electrode. And at that electrode, copper metal is being produced. So at my positive electrode, chlorine gas is produced at my negative electrode, copper metal is produced. And we can say that opposites are attracting here. My negative ions are moving towards a positive electrode, and my positive ions are moving towards a negative electrode. So electricity, as our conclusion, can be used to split up ionic compounds. They have to be ionic because they have to contain ions which are able to move around in solution like we have here. Positive ions move towards the negative electrode to produce and at our negative electrode we've produced copper metal. Our negative ions have moved towards the positive electrode And that has produced chlorine gas. So at each of the electrodes, we now have the elements which make up the ionic compound, or we have taken our ionic compound and split it into those two elements using electricity. So what I want you to do for me, guys, is I want you to copy those notes into your jotter 
um, any of the slides which have the little pencil icon, you're going to copy those notes into your jotter. And then um, you're going to try the electrolysis experiment right up with a different compound. If you need to, you can come back and have a look at this video and you can see how I've drawn my apparatus, how I've labelled my apparatus. And you can see how each of the different ions which are in the solution are being passed through and going to each of the electrodes. If you need any help, you can always give me a little email or leave a comment and I'll get back to you. Have a lovely day, guys.